astroturfing, which sounds like a new teen trend of fucking artificial grass while eating Cascade pods. That's right, the teens have moved on from Tide. It's all about Cascade now. <laughs> astroturfing is the practice of corporations or political groups disguising themselves as spontaneous, authentic, popular movements. It's basically fake grassroots. That's why they call it astroturfing. It's a very funny, very clever name. Now, you are probably familiar <laughs> with astroturfing as a concept from seeing ads by groups with uh, generic populist-sounding names like Americans Against Food Taxes delivering weirdly specific messages like these. Washington is talking about a new tax on juice drinks and soda. They say it's only pennies. Well, those pennies add up when you're trying to feed a family. Washington, if you're listening, what doesn't seem like much to you can be a lot to us. Tell Congress, no taxes on juice, drinks, and sodas. Now, it won't surprise you to learn that Americans Against Food Taxes was not started by regular Americans pooling their resources together to take out a large ad buy on national TV about their number one problem priority, <laughs> a proposed soda tax. No, it was a front group for the food and beverage industry, which makes a lot more sense. Soda companies have a lot of money, at least enough to convince LeBron James to pretend he drinks Sprite. <laughs> Sprite! <laughs> Diabetes you can taste. <laughs> and, and while you might think, well, yeah, but that's obvious, I I'd never fall for AstroTurf bullshit like that, don't be quite so sure. Because with dark money surging in the wake of decisions like Citizens United, AstroTurf techniques are now becoming more sophisticated, effective and dangerous, and they are not going away. So tonight, we thought it might be useful to take a look at some of those techniques to help us better spot them in the future. And let's just start with the names themselves. Because sometimes groups are created with deliberately misleading names. For instance, the group Save Our Tips, which purportedly speaks for wait staff, is an anti-minimum wage increase group funded by restaurant owners. The National Wetlands Coalition worked on behalf of oil companies and real estate developers. And the American Council on Science and Health has been funded by, among other things, fracking interests, soda companies, e-cigarette companies and chemical manufacturers. So it's pure, straight-up opposite world. It's like if this show was called Funny Time Happy Hour with Chuckle Hunk John Oliver. <laughs> it's just demonstrably false. We can't back that shit up. <laughs> and look, it's not always easy to spot exactly what a group's motive is, especially with an ad like this. Tony here, and I'm mad. What's with you people tossing money at the Humane Society of the United States? These HSUS losers aren't even affiliated with your local pet shelter. For more information, go to humanewatch.org. That is a very strange ad, because, first of all, if you're going to have a talking dog, why would you make him such a gruff asshole? <laughs> hey, I'm Tony and I'm mad! The Humane Society's a bunch of losers and if you disagree, you can suck my dog dick! <laughs> and, and second, second, who would take out an attack ad on the Humane Society? <laughs> a rival, even humaner society? Puppy mills? Self-loathing dogs? It's impossible to say for sure. All I can tell you is that ad is the work of Rick Berman, a PR expert who's known in the industry as Dr. Evil. He is known for his defences of controversial products, from uh, secondhand smoke uh, to trans fats to payday loans. He's also created non-profit groups that have fought regulation of all of those things. In fact, it's one of those groups, the, Consenta, the Center for Consumer Freedom, which was credited on that Humane Society attack ad. So... If, is the Centre for Consumer Freedom a front group for Berman's corporate clients? Is it at all relevant that Rick Berman has shown up at events for the pork industry, an industry which has been targeted by the Humane Society in the past for the use of gestation crates, or, as Rick Berman insists on calling them, maternity pens? I can't say. I legally can't say. I want to. I badly want to. <laughs> but I've been explicitly told I can't. You can probably guess, but I can't say it out loud. <laughs> What I can say is that Berman rejects any accusation that he runs front groups for corporate clients, saying there is no front because there is total transparency, which is a little odd, considering we don't know who's behind many of his campaigns. And that message of transparency does seem to significantly change whenever he's behind closed doors, because here is audio of Berman pitching his services to a group of oil executives. People always ask me one question all the time. He said, how do I know that, is, that I won't be found out as a supporter of what you're doing? We run all of this stuff through nonprofit organizations that are insulated from having to disclose donors. There's total anonymity. See? 
transparency. But, well, look, look, he is right. There is total anonymity. And just as a general rule, if the most common question you get asked is, how do I know no one will find out I'm doing business with you? That's not a great sign. <laughs> it's the same privacy guarantee that Hardee's gives all of its customers. Don't worry, none of your friends, family or co-workers will ever find out that you've been doing this. Now, <laughs> go and enjoy your monster thick burger before the horse meat gets cold. <laughs> but astroturfing is more, way more, than just funneling money through non-profit front groups. Groups can also recruit questionable experts to lend their arguments credibility. There are mul multiple examples of this, but my favourite concerns a group called Citizens for Fire Safety. A few years back, health officials in California wanted to remove a requirement that furniture contain chemical flame retardants, as they had been linked to cancer. But Citizens for Fire Safety produced a burn surgeon, Dr David Heimbach, who argued for keeping all of those flame retardant requirements by telling them a pretty memorable story. A seven-week-old baby was in a crib laying on a fire retardant mattress on a non-fire retardant pillow. Mom put a candle in the crib. Candle fell over. The baby sustained a 50% burn. The entire upper half of her body was burned. Now, this is a, a tiny little person, no bigger than my Italian greyhound at home. She ultimately died after about three weeks of pain and misery in the hospital. Now, that sounds horrifying, but there are some weird things about what he just said. First, I don't know why he felt the need to compare the size of a baby to his Italian greyhound. <laughs> Everyone knows what size a baby is. <laughs> Nobody's never seen a baby. So, wait, it's like a person but smaller. Tell me more. Does it use stilts? How does it board a bus? What I'm picturing is something about the size of five hamsters taped together or a very small lawnmower. Am I around the right ballpark here? But second, if part of you there was wondering, hold on, who puts a candle in their baby's crib? You're not alone. Journalists with the Chicago Tribune wondered the exact same thing, and they soon discovered that two years earlier, Heimbach had testified before a different California panel telling a weirdly similar story. I will tell you about a child I took care of in April. Mom had a candle sitting at beside the bed, left the room for seven minutes. For reasons we don't know, the child, the candle turned over. The child sustained an 80% burn. Okay, so now this is starting to sound a little suspicious. How many people are putting lit candles <laughs> in and around their baby's cribs? Oh, I just put little Ethan to bed. I put plenty of lit candles in his crib as a nightlight. <laughs> and I balanced several sharp knives and open cans of paint thinner right on the crib wall so he has something to look at. <laughs> but look, but look, Heimbach wasn't done because just a year later he was testifying before the state legislature in Alaska and guess what? A six-week-old baby that I took care of uh, earlier this year. Mother went away, there was a candle on a bureau. Somehow the dog knocked the candle onto the crib and the little girl sustained a 75% very devastating burn. Wait, so now there's a dog involved all of a sudden? <laughs> what kind of dog would do such a thing? Wait a second, I know exactly what kind of dog. A gruff, needlessly Italian dog like Tony. Bad dog, bad dog. Now, as if, as if sensing that lawmakers there were questioning his motives, the very next sentence that Heimbach said, completely unprompted, was this. I am not in the pocket of anybody that makes a specific flame retardant. Now, to be fair, he's actually right about that. He was not in the pocket of someone that made a specific flame retardant. He was, however, in the pocket of Citizens for Fire Safety, who paid him $240,000 for his help and who, it turned out, only had three members, which were the three largest makers of flame retardants in the world. So, I call it liar, liar, pants chemically incapable of catching on fire. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. When a reporter called the medical examiner's office, they had no record of any burn victim matching Heimbach's description whatsoever, so one of them did the next logical thing. I thought the best thing to do was just to call them at home. I said, those kids you talked about, did they all die in your hospital? And he said, it wasn't factual. That was anecdotal. And I said, but that's not what you testified. And he said, well, I wasn't under oath. Okay, okay. 
Well, first of all, you're generally expected to tell the truth even when you're not under oath. <laughs> and second of all, anecdotes aren't the same as lies. I saw Kerry Russell walking out of a bakery. That's an anecdote. It's not a good anecdote, but it is an anecdote. I saw Kerry Russell riding a dragon out of a bakery. <laughs> that is a lie, although admittedly would be a way better story. <laughs> and look, the real problem there is Heimbach's lies worked. That flame retardant bill in California initially failed, thanks in part to his testimony. And, and the final and perhaps most controversial tool in astroturfing relates to something that our current president actually loves to complain about. I'll tell you what. You take a look outside. These are paid protesters, folks. The protesters are paid a lot of money by the DNC. It turned out that the protesters we used to have were bought for $1,500 a piece. We have a protester. By the way, were you paid $1,500 to be a thug? Now, I can't work it quite out there. Is Trump angry there? Or, or is he excited that he's just stumbled onto a job opportunity that Don Jr. and Eric would actually be qualified for? But, but while Trump's specific accusations were nonsense, paid demonstrators do exist, which Trump should frankly know himself, because his campaign reportedly had actors who were paid $50 to cheer for him at his campaign announcement. <laughs> but, but paid demonstrators are one of the most infuriating tools of astroturfing. Just, just look at what happened last year in New Orleans. A, a company called Entergy needed city council approval for a controversial power plant, which it got not long after a public meeting where, by sheer chance, a bunch of huge power plant fans in orange shirts turned up. <laughs> now, it later emerged that a PR firm working for Entergy hired a company called Crowds On Demand, which recruited actors to support the plants. They did this with a Facebook ad which offered, and I quote, 60 to 200 dollary dues <laughs> to help with a gig for three hours, which in itself right there is a red flag. Dollary dues. <laughs> Sounds like slang for money that you'd find in a Mark Twain novel called Even for the 1800s. There are way too many N-words in this. <laughs> now, Crowds on Demand even provided talking points, such as, folks, this is 2017, we had a boil water advisory here last month, and I'm tired of feeling like I live in a third world country. And it seems like some of the people there took those notes and ran with them. I'm tired of feeling like we're living in a third world country. This is the United States of America. It's 2017 going on 2018, and we have to worry about these frequent water boil advisories and so on and so forth. I have to be concerned that a grandmother or a son or a pet could possibly drink or take in some brain-eating amoeba. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give him credit for that last bit. The brain-eating amoeba bit was all his own. He was just riffing hard at that point. <laughs> now... Now, that man insists that he believed everything he said and that he wasn't paid by crowds on demand, although you should know that another person there who does admit to being paid said he received instructions that read a few things to keep in mind. One, tell nobody you're being paid. Two, tell nobody you're being paid. Three, media will be present, do not talk to them. Four, tell nobody you're being paid. And five, if somebody approaches you, don't tell them you're being paid. Which are, and this is true, word for word, the vows in a traditional Scientology wedding. <laughs> now, it's beautiful. They're beautiful vows and you should go. Now, if you are wondering who is behind Crowds on Demand, let me introduce you to their CEO, Adam Swart. The answer to the question, what if a lukewarm bottle of Smirnoff ice was a person? <laughs> now, now he, is, he is pretty unrepentant about what his firm does. Have you ever provided protesters for an event? Of course. Demonstrators? Of course. Do you see anything wrong with that? Personally, no. Do you ever feel like you're tricking people, though, into getting behind something that they may have not gotten behind if they didn't see all this activity there? We don't trick people, we engage them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you engage them by tricking them, don't you? Both, both of those things can be true at the same time. It's like someone saying, I'm not masturbating in the middle of this Pinkberry, I'm just engaging the police department. <laughs> you're actually doing both, and one doesn't make the other okay. Now, of course, Swart's whole ruse is predicated on people holding their nerve and not giving the game away in real time. But amazingly, that has happened. In the small town of Camarillo... I think the city needs a shake-up. Citizens aren't shy about expressing their opinions. But one chilly Wednesday night in December... Prince Jordan Tyson? City officials say this man stood out. 
This case is clearly common sense. Because for three minutes, he told the city council what he later admits was a lie. So I'm just a concerned citizen coming up here and speaking to you. But he's not. He's a self-described struggling actor from Beverly Hills who goes by the name of Prince Jordan Tyson. Okay, no, I don't believe it. I do not believe it does anything about this face. This face say struggling actor from Beverly Hills to you. I'm sorry, this story just doesn't check out, but incredibly, it's true. Because while the notorious PJT initially claimed to be from the area, he soon had a crisis of confidence culminating in this. 40 minutes later, Tyson came back to the podium. Prince is back, man. For one of the strangest yeah. moments the city council has ever Prince, seen. I don't agree with the reason I'm here, and I was paid to be here. How much were you paid? 100 bucks. How much? A hundred dollars. You fucking idiot, Prince! <laughs> you just broke crowds on demand rules one, two, four, and five. <laughs> now you won't get those hundred dollar e dues, which could have gone toward changing your name to literally anything else, <laughs> or getting a haircut that doesn't make you look like an al dente Owen Wilson. <laughs> and look, so when you add all of this together, fake groups hiring fake experts and fake crowds which manage to affect real-world change, it gets pretty dispiriting and it can do real damage that goes way beyond the narrow issues that each group is trying to influence. The very existence of companies like Crowds On Demand mean that something authentic can now be tainted. In fact, conspiracy boards now regularly and wrongly cite Crowds On Demand as providing everything from paid protesters for Charlottesville to crisis actors for the Las Vegas shooting. And that is hugely dangerous, because the consequences of this cannot be that everyone assumes that anyone who doesn't agree with them is astroturf. You know, while, while skepticism is healthy, cynicism, real cynicism, is toxic. And because this problem isn't going away, going away, it is now even more incumbent on us to use our judgment diligently. If the Ray Liotta of dogs is telling us <laughs> the humane society is terrible, it's probably worth us all asking, why? Why? Who might have trained him? And what do they stand to gain? And unfortunately, until we find out a way to force AstroTurf groups to be more transparent and accountable, that's about all we can do right now. AstroTurfing is a serious threat to our public discourse, and it is critical that we are all much more aware of its dangers. And since AstroTurfers have left all their tools lying around, at the very least, we might as well use them to fight candle fire with candle fire <laughs> and deliver a heartfelt message. We're all Americans, real people, definitely not actors. We're just a coalition of concerned doctors, mothers, teachers, and kidnappers. And we think you deserve the truth about astroturfers. Here are the facts. Astroturfers are responsible for every shark attack in American history. Wonder where all the bees have gone? Astroturfers shot him in the face. And according to the Bipartisan Institute of Factual Science Studies, every single astroturfer has killed at least one puppy with their bare hands. Or maybe not. We're not under oath. The point is, AstroTurfers set this baby on fire. That's not a doll. That's a real baby. No bigger than an Italian greyhound. Her name's Eleanor, and she likes four things. Her binky, her baba, corporate and political transparency, and not being on fire. And right now, Eleanor is over four. And if you're not careful, one day an AstroTurfer is going to come to your house and light your baby on fire. Stop AstroTurfing. Paid for by citizens for fresher orange juice. <laughs>